Hello, everyone. My name is Esby, and I'm the Associate Director of Strategy here at Tea Leaves. It gives me such a great pleasure to welcome everyone to this design festival. It's a virtual festival blending internal wellness with the external environment to arrive at a resilient future. Today, we're joined by four powerhouses to discuss the future and ethics of AI. We'll be diving into the complex responsibilities and opportunities for designers who use data as material to create social impact through an inclusive design of products and services. I'm going to now hand it over to Jennifer to start the session. Yeah, I'm so excited to get started. We're going to jump in and, and start with some level setting, a little bit of context. Let, let's talk a little bit, of, a little bit about the topic of AI and what we mean even level setting or what we mean when we say AI, AI artificial intelligence, and when we talk about machine learning. What is that and why are people talking about it? Well, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, uh, I, I, if we were in a room and I could get a show of hands, of course, looking at some of the people who are here, I think you know the answer. But we've been using the term artificial intelligence since 1955. The idea of artificial intelligence has existed at least since the late 40s. And some people say it's existed for 2000 years. And machine learning has existed since in name since about 1952. So there's this question I've got, which is why do we keep saying AI is the new blah, 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 blah. I actually collect instances of this, like AI is the new black, AI is the new UI, um, AI, big data is the new oil. So there's something in that, right? It's not just the artificial intelligence that's old enough to collect social security, but it's something <laughs> else now. So I wonder, I wonder if the three of you might have something to say about what it is today. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. What, where do we see it today out in the world? I mean, it's in everything. Like, can some examples that come to mind the things for you, Jamika? Yeah, it's in everything and in things that we may not realize it's in. You know, there, there are some really nice examples of things that we can see now and things that are coming. Uh, for example, Netflix, that's a good example, right? Yeah. Netflix actually makes recommendations to you about movies or TV shows not just based on your past views and what you've watched in the past, but also on what other people with similar interests have watched in the past. And it will reveal to you opportunities to explore movies that it believes you'd be interested in. And that's not by uh, happenstance. There's, there, there are a lot of algorithms that help to determine uh, what might make a really great viewing experience for you. And that's by design the personalized experiences that we see around the world, the recommendations of opportunities to learn more, to be exposed to more, come with a whole lot of data, come with a whole lot of information that we rummage through and sort of make assessments around and assess to really understand how can we provide an optimal experience for you as the consumer, as the customer. Um, and we can think about the things to come or maybe things that some of us in certain parts of the country and world are seeing and others aren't. For example, self-driving cars are an example as well of being able to train a, an inhumane object or an inhuman object. We can debate whether or not it's inhuman, inhumane or not, but you know, how are we training machines and using models to train machines? to, in effect, replace things that humans are actually in, originally intended to do through intelligence. And what does it mean to model intelligence? And, you know, I'll say without giving too much away, I think we're going to talk about more of this stuff, but what does it mean to really train these algorithms, to train these machines, and what kinds of data, what kinds of information are we using to train these machines? And I think that's where we have questions around the the ability to really reach everybody or as many people as we can uh, and to reflect as many experiences as we can in these experiences, recognizing that we bring our own biases to bear in the work. So those are just some of the experiences and I'm sure others have, have other um, ideas as well, but uh, those are the ones that come to mind. Um, I, I'm actually happy to pile on that because um, yeah, great, Netflix is a great experience. Uh, example but it's it's everywhere and it's not an exaggeration because we are not aware of all the different thing, ways in which AI is part of our lives and I want to give um, example for from my own experience so I was uh, I was leading this 
uh, project. It was many years ago. I was leading this project and it was kind of a side project. I managed to, to get some developers to work um, as volunteers with me. And we had this exciting idea to do something. And we use things like OCR, which is the um, character recognition. And we use things like uh, Bing search and we used all kinds of neat technologies. And one day it just dawned on me that actually OCR is AI. It is machine learning. It is an automated way on how do we uh, recognize um, text and words, right? I didn't know that because we didn't call it AI. We just said, yeah, and we're using OCR. And I'm sure that if you look around in your life, you'll find a lot of things that you didn't think about uh, as being AI or machine learning. And AI is a big word. It's a very loaded term, right? Um, I'd like to kind of bring down the discussion into kind of nuts and bolts because what it is really is a bunch of algorithms that do things in a smart way, but basically each one of them is doing something that is very uh, specific to a very specific context that can't translate to other contexts mostly. And it's, I don't know that I would call it intelligent. I, it just, does things the way it's intended. And when we're saying AI, there are all these visions of either, you know, the, the utop utopian feature, uh, future where everything kind of is magic and the technology is just in the background and we humans are doing amazing things, or it's the killing robots that are after us and we're all going to die soon. But the truth is, way more mundane and this is where we have to kind of think about and this is where we need to pay attention because it's i i, I think about ai as something that is very um is very influential but in very very subtle ways and it's like many beats that you put together on a string and together they create like this either big beautiful thing or horrible thing but it all depends on the intent and the amount of thinking that you put into it so this is my, my take or on where do we find ai and what do we do with it thank you yeah no it's in everything um and uh, so one of our one of the questions asked, you know, was was to talk a little bit more about the biases that exist that we might not be innately aware of, um, which is something that we're we're going to get to in this into the, this sort of next section of uh, of conversation. And related to that, I think part of the genesis of this conversation or the, this discussion was the notion that we're we are at an inflection point. In examining those biases and and even just in the way that we talk about machine learning and AI. Um, can you share your perspectives around, you know, why that might be? Why, why is now different? Mm. Why yeah. is it? Go ahead. Go ahead, Molly. No, no. I'm not leaning in to speak. I'm leaning in to read the questions. Oh, um, well, I'd like to hear some of those questions and even some of those perspectives. Um, uh, you know, it's hard not to see anything that we're talking about these days outside of the lens of uh, recognizing uh, racism around us, systemic oppression around us, and the barriers that can um, not just keep all of us from participating and from perhaps experiencing those liberties that are really supposed to be for everybody, but, but really aren't. But also it reminds us of how deeply a lot of these perspectives run and how pervasive they are. So as pervasive as um, uh, 
AI and machine learning activities and products and services are in our lives, there are just as pervasive and prevailing biases that were used in developing the te these technologies that are around us. And so we are, many of us anyway, are really asking questions around why is it this way? Why do we do things this way? And how might we do better? How might we call ourselves out? And how might we find ways to develop the kinds of experiences or support the kinds of experiences that truly are equitable? And from a perspective of thinking about this from uh, certainly an equity perspective, well, what does that mean? It means really recognizing that the way we build these algorithms that Ruth was talking about has to be explored a little bit. Algorithms are nothing more than just steps to solve a problem. And if we think about what it means to create the steps to solve a problem, then who's creating those steps? Uh, what kinds of problems are we solving? And what is the experience of those problem solvers, those innovators, uh, relative to those who actually might be using or on the end, end ending part or the user part of those experiences that we're developing. And so I think what we're seeing now a lot is a maybe a resurgence, but certainly an awareness, an increased awareness mm -hmm. of how we're developing things, these things around us and why it really matters to be more thoughtful, to be more equitable in the way we create the kinds of solutions that, that really do matter for people. I think it's also important to think of the fact that when we're talking about AI, we're talking in algorithms, we're talking about things that process data. And data right. comes from the past. It comes from something that has already happened. And so there's always a problem with data sets that you are going to reinforce existing biases rather than finding new ways to do things. And there are a number of ways to do this, or a number, a number of examples of this that are kind of out there, things that happened um, with, for instance, the word to vec um, uh, data set for word vectors and, and um, built, it basically demonstrated um, built in uh, gender biases that there were some interest, there was some interesting work about how that could be later corrected. And I see that um, in, in the chat, there have been a couple of different examples come up too of, um, of different fixes and approaches, some of which are kind of controversial. Um, and um, and I also haven't, I see that um, Leon Wang is saying that the Cognitive Bias Codex um, is showing the, um, is, is an infographic that's showing that, that kind of bias. I haven't had a chance to see that, so thank you for that. Um, but it, it requires a different kind of work, right? Because we talk about data being objective. And if objectivity is based on something that's happened in the past that you reinforce in the present, then you keep doing the same thing and you run the risk of perpetuating those biases. So what Jamika is saying about, about finding ways to open up equity and who gets involved, that actually has, a, that has an impact on the data that we collect, the data that we use, and how those algorithms affect our worlds. And I also want to, to say that the way I'm thinking about it, and I, plus one to everything Molly just said, uh, is it's maybe you shouldn't think about it as biases, but as values, right? Because mm -hmm. we all have biases. The, everything in the world, it's part of our kind of basic way that we are built in. Um, <laughs> this is how we could uh, just see the world around us and recognize patterns uh, quickly and not be killed, right? So it's part of us to have that quick assessment of, okay, this is the situation, right? And people took it to all kinds of places. And again, going back to the, uh, to the point of paying attention in the world of AI, we can't think about it as, uh, as math and as algorithms alone, like Kathy O'Neill was pointing out, right? We have to acknowledge the fact that we as people, as humans who are creating the systems, and on top of that, the, the humans who are creating the products that use those systems are part of this equation, right? And we have to figure out in each and every one of these applications, what do we want to achieve, right? What are the human values behind that? And then make sure that the way that the system behaves is it matches and aligns to these values. 
if we don't do that, we are kind of saying we are not accountable for what we're building. And that's a big problem, right? Because accountability is one of the, the, these core principles. We can't just throw it out and say, oh, I don't know, the, the AI did it. The butler was the murderer. <laughs> yes, we sent the butler. So we have to take accountability and work with that. And all these things that are happening, it's don't, don't blame the math, right? Yeah, I mean, that to me is one of the differences, like the what about now is a, is a starting to come to terms with a recognition of the, the biases or however you want to put that, that, that what goes in is what comes out. That's right. And that we are That's all right. responsible and accountable for understanding that and being deliberate and how we recognize and mitigate that and open our lenses so that we can bring other experiences into that and really shape the way we're designing the things, which then shapes the, you know, the way that their experience, it shapes access, it shapes participation. Mm -hmm. um, I know mean, we talked a little bit about the, um, Molly, you mentioned data collection as a starting point, like the, the inputs. Um, I know there are tons of examples out there of, of how we've perpetuated bias and exclusion through the way that we've collected data and thinking about what, present, what representation and collection means. Um, Jamika, I know that's something that you work in, you work with now, is that, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, yes, Anne, this is why I like these conversations. <laughs> you know, we, we get to talk about things that we want to say, right? And so I, yes, I have examples of that and, and am influenced again by, uh, uh, our work through Black Computer, but just in how I see the world and, and thinking about intersectionality, which is this idea that, um, you know, we are multidimensional as people, especially as, as Black women, for example, and there are areas where we're not just talking about race and gender and education or socioeconomics, we're talking about the, the, the power and the privilege that's at play in recognizing that uh, context matters in terms of what power I have, what privileges I have and, or don't have in certain spaces. And I, I wanna go back to one of these things that, that you said were, maybe we call biases values. I think that's a, a really fascinating way of thinking about it. And if I push that a bit further, and I would love for you to push back on this, what you might value might be a bias against me and we don't even realize it. So whatever we call it, to your point, Jen, let's acknowledge that it might not be the same held truth or experience that somebody else does. But where it comes more obvious is when these folks who do hold very different values, biases and experiences than, than, than I do, who is not seen as someone who is a majority power in this world, and I can argue otherwise in lots of other contexts, but let's just stick right there for a minute. I'm not seen as someone who has a lot of power or privilege. And so if I'm not the one who's developing the technologies that work for me, then what does that mean for me who's using those technologies? And a really great example of this is what many of you might have seen in Joy Bulamwini's work, where she is representing the Algorithmic Justice League, right, and has uncovered that we will use technology and have used technology to develop biometrics problem solvers, right, to identify people. And what she was able to find, and you can look it up and find our really great article. She talks a lot about this, and it's a really expository piece of work because it shows that the, the inherent biases or values that we have as people, and that's a, that's a judgment call, right? To say that what you identify as a value, um, and it's something not something that I have experience with, is it's a, it's a judgment call. But irrespective of that, we use these tendencies to design these experiences and to develop these experiences independent of insights from the very people with whom we have very little experience. And so in her work, she has uncovered that we can use these devices that are designed to determine who we are by facial recognition, again, AI, AI software. And when you take lots and lots and lots of these software results and pull them together, which is the value of AI and training these kinds of data, you know, we don't actually identify black women in these pit in these pictures. If we were to take these pictures of black women that are part of this data set, they're not categorized as black women, they're characterized as men. And so I'm robbed of my womanhood 
because the technology valued very different experiences. So thinking about what that means is, is critical, but we don't have those conversations. And I don't think it's necessarily meant to be belligerent or purposefully, I'm out to develop this technology that doesn't work for black women, it calls them men. But the problem with that is, often we're not at the table where we even recognize that there's a value of representing those experiences that are not our own. That's really what it's about. It may not be that we're gonna be adding a lot more black people or brown people or transgender people to those tables where we're developing these technologies. We should be, but that's another conversation. But what does it mean for those of us who are at those tables, thinking outside of ourselves, using our biases for good, right? So that we recognize that there's more to the story. And so I'll stop there, but I, I would love to talk more about that and, and push back on these notions that are not necessarily meant to be uh, derisive. Sometimes they are, but if we just challenge that and recognize, okay, well, your values may not be mine, then I recognize that. So how do we meet in the middle and recognize that there's a whole group of people whose experience is not even representing? I, I am totally in agreement with you. The fact that what, a, what I'm getting at is that we need to pay attention and we need to have intent, right? This is what values are about. If we're just, because biases part of the of them being biases um, is that sometimes we don't even know they're there, right? So we have to surface the situation and talk about our assumptions and talk about how we want to deal with them. And of course, not everybody holds the same opinions, right? Like people have opposite opinions about everything and sometimes I have opposite opinion about something myself right like I say yeah but it could be this and it could be that it's not easy right it's not easy but it's something that if we don't do we're going to regret and you know Ellen Cooper had this wonderful talk about uh, the Oppenheimer moment in uh, interaction um, 18 and he was talking about that moment of realization of this big damage that was done, right? And he was talking about ancestry thinking. How can we think like ancestors? What is the type of world that we are going to leave to our, uh, to our children and our different offsprings? And this is what we need to do. I'm not saying we have to, um, to declare one set of values as the objective truth for everything because there isn't such a thing but we have to have these discussions and we have to float those decisions to the people who are about to use them and give them the power give them the control to decide if they want to use that or not if we don't do that that's a problem right it's and this is what makes it all complex it's not like oh, okay we have a fairness checklist that everything goes under and once we hit every item we're good it's an ongoing conversation and this is i in one of our former conversations someone brought up the the term um a slow food right and i really really love that um that metaphor Right, we have to kind of pause for a minute, maybe have a glass of wine and talk about it, right? Enjoy the technology, make sure that it's really delightful. If we don't do that, kind of we busted. And this is right now what we're doing. We are we're just enamored with technologies and we forget the people behind them. I wanted to piggyback on what you've both said about um, and pull in a little bit of discussion I'm seeing come up in some of the chats. Um, there's a question about how you teach the design of AI. And I think there is kind of a bigger question here about how, does, how AI is taught in universities at all. So I'm at a university with the, with the or some of the top ranked um, AI and machine learning programs in the country, if not the world. And there is, um, I believe we had the first AI undergraduate major. And as a part of that undergraduate major, there was an ethics course. So the way that this works is at the center, there's the core of math and computer science that you need to learn. And Jamika is our computer scientist, so she knows this way better. 
I do. And then there's an angle around there. There's a circle around that where you're going to start dealing with programming languages. And then you're going to get to human computer interaction. And then at the external part on the core, you've got ethics. And when that was presented to me for the first time, I was like, huh, we do it the other way around when we're coming at it from design. Right. Right. You know, at the center is how humans interact with each other, what our value systems are, right? If we're doing human-centered design, and then you, you go outward to levels of abstraction, to human-computer interaction, to various programming languages, and then maybe in the end, if you are a very nerdy interaction designer or UX person, you're gonna get to coding stuff and the math core that would be necessary for you to develop algorithms. And what I find myself thinking is rather than these two disks on one hand, we need, we need to think of this three-dimensionally like a globe or a sphere mm -hmm. and find ways to work back and forth between the necessity of understanding the logic of AI, right? And the logic of algorithms, which you learn by coding and the necessity of understanding human interaction. And I could take that a step further into some more complicated ways as well, because I think that none of this curriculum is any good unless we start having people who are ethicists on the boards of universities or on the boards of corporations. So if you don't have someone with a seat at the table asking questions about racial equity or gender equity or intersectionality or ethics, you're not going to be, it's not going to be baked into um, the strategies of the universities or the corporations that we're talking about. And we have started to see that, right? Different ways companies are handling mm -hmm. responsibility around AI, um, new roles, things like that. Yeah. I, uh, Ruth, go ahead. You. Yeah. I just want to say that um, in Microsoft, there's a, a new team called the Office of Responsible AI. And yeah. this is their job definition to make sure that we are handling um, AI development um, in an ethical way, in a responsible way. I want to actually, I want to maybe remove the world, the word ethical in it because it gets into a very philosophical realm, which is great. It, it has a lot of value, but if we're talking about how do we make things actionable, talk about ethics with engineers, you get this blank stare, right? You want to talk to them in a way that makes sense in an operational way. And you say, okay, these are the things that I need to do or I need to think about, or these are, this is, these are the, the rules in a way, right? Um, and this is what this, uh, this team is doing, is trying to k kind of create these frameworks in which things are very practical and people can understand what do I need to go and do next. Again, the, the word practical there is relatively practical. It's not a, a, you know, a rule book that has answers to everything, but it's more of the questions that we need to ask ourselves be before we develop technology. And this is not something that is going to change everything like in the next three months, right? We're talking long-term change, but this is what we're also talking about in this panel because these things take time and we can't even figure, um, I don't know, basic uh, societal um, things for ourselves. So this is kind of another level on top of that. But definitely, I can see change in the way companies are, are trying to do things, at least some of them. Um, and one more thing is that I think that a lot of the maybe smaller companies, they can't afford the overhead to put some people that their sole, um, sole purpose of existence is to figure these things out. And this is where big companies are there. And this is where they can, you know, change the playing field by leading by example and sharing this uh, knowledge with other teams and with other companies and say, okay, this is how we do it. 
and then it's easier to adapt something that has been tried on larger scale. So. Yeah, someone just mentioned many of the larger companies were founded, uh, wait, by engineers who likely, <laughs> likely rank low on the empathy scale. Uh, re relates to a question uh, that came in around the number of AI researchers being hired away from universities to work at private companies and the notion um, that the primary objective of those companies is to increase share price versus benefiting humanity. How do we think about that? I mean, I did, that's the word, maybe the role, where the role of the designer comes in to play. A question could be, do they have to be mutually exclusive? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, if, if I look at Jamika, she's someone who's been in academia in really big research and is now in corporate America. And I really think the work she does is benefiting humanity. So maybe there are ways to look across. Similarly with Ruth's work um, within Microsoft, maybe there are ways with the scope that it's possible to do a kind of good that you might not be able to do at a smaller scale. Yeah, I, I certainly, thank you for that shout out. A uh, little bit of bio. <laughs> uh, thank you, Molly. Um, I completely agree, right? And, and you know, I, I am a computer scientist by training. And so I see the world very systematically and enjoy sort of digging into the problem space. A little gray doesn't bother me at all, which actually nicely also fits my sociology and psychology and anthropology training which is weird when you think about that as a computer scientist perspective. And I also recognize that uh, in my trainings, I ascribe really heavily to human computer interaction and HCI and the design that brings us to the, to the really natural and creative creatives of my purely designed colleagues. And so um, to that point, Molly, I absolutely do bring both of those sides to the table. But I also bring, I think, a level of exper experience, perspectives, um, past research, and in many ways, you know, uh, knowing that what we've seen before probably isn't going to get us to where we want to go. And thinking about being critical and lovingly critical, certainly, but to the level of how do we provide that drive locally versus what happens when the top does that as well. And I think we have to take as many approaches as we possibly can in thinking about how we're gonna make the kind of change in the world. And, and as an example of that, you know, one of the questions uh, raised was how do we take that intersectional approach, that intersectionality piece that is research and comes from sociology and Kim Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw talked about it from a law perspective. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins has been talking about this for many, many years. And so giving a name to it helps us to understand what it is, but you know, does anybody have to tell you what it's like to feel the, like you're the only person in a space? Does anybody have to tell you what it feels like to, to not really feel that you belong in a certain place, even though you've got the same credentials as other people? Those kinds of feelings are human. That's what it means to live. And so what might it look like, not just to think about what Black people experience or what gay people experience, but what do people experience? It's the human experience. And there, you know, there are different schools of thought about, well, thinking of all humanity is kind of not what we're talking about here. But what we're doing is, is we're pushing the boundaries of what it means to have a definition of a certain thing and recognizing that uh, all of those perspectives may not be in the room, but they actually can show up in these kinds of conversations and pushing people to sort of question, well, am I doing this the right way? Or what are the other perspectives? And, and just to close the loop on that, if, if, if you're looking for ways to really understand how we can get beyond these dimensions that are easily, we can notice easily by our eyes um, uh, and we can argue about that. I mean, I, you can see that I'm black. I, 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 re I sort of show up and acknowledge that I'm cisgender. Um, but what if that weren't the case? What if you didn't really know? We have gender fluidity is, is, is important to recognize as well. But people may not often feel comfortable talking about those things because it's not mainstream. And so what intersectionality allows us to do is to recognize that there are these different dimensions of what it means to show up, to, to live, to do the work. And recognizing that those different dimensions are actually can, can connect us. You know, what I like to often use a lot is I might in certain contexts have a lot more in common with a white guy from the Northeast than another black woman from the South, which is where I'm from. 
And it has everything to do with our lived experiences where we often fall short in the space of inclusion. So inclusion is like everybody has a seat at the table and that's absolutely true. We do have a seat at the table. Um, intersectionality goes further and says, well, not only do you have a seat at the table, but we recognize the role of power and privilege in our places at the table. So everybody may not actually have the same time to speak, or everybody may not have the same experience in getting to the table in the first place, but recognizing that there are all these dimensions of lived experiences and that you may not realize the, the level of power that I actually bring to bear because that's not where your mind is thinking. And I think that helps us to think about the role of intersectionality in our work and it helps us to get outside of ourselves a bit more. Ready for start? I was look, I'm looking through the questions that we were, I was going to shift to have us talk a little bit more, more specifically and actually very related to, to everything you just said, Jamika, about the role of designers and how you know, reframing the outcomes that we're looking for and thinking more, um, incorporating an outside in perspective in the work does potentially change the outcome. And how using data and working with AI changes the role of a designer and, and how it changes the design process itself. And I know, Ruth, I know that's something that you've been thinking about quite a bit in your work at Microsoft. Um, yeah, I think um, the, the simple... I'll keep looking at the question. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, one thing is about raising awareness. That's the, the first thing that designers can do. Uh, I think that for, for us and for people who has grown up in this discipline and, you know, they're averse with um, design thinking, it's not a, a huge leap into this new world. It's basically, again, putting people in the center, saying, okay, we need to think about who are the people, who are the stakeholders, what do they need, and how do we design to, uh, to satisfy their needs. And the difference with AI is that AI has some unique um, attributes or characteristics that kind of classical engineering uh, doesn't. So for example, it is uh, probabilistic, right? So everything that is probabilistic is prone to making errors. And we have to take that into account. Now it doesn't, it doesn't mean that before we didn't have errors, but now it's part of the system. It's part of the DNA of the AI. So we have to be aware of that and think really carefully about what kind of errors can happen, what are the harms that can happen as a consequence of these errors, and what are the ways in which we can mitigate them. And it's not just about looking at the algorithms and say, oh, we need to change this and that. We need to look at the entire end-to-end -end product development cycle and say, okay, maybe we can't solve this thing in the model or yet in the model, right? Because they, uh, they uh, need some time to grow, but can we do something with the user experience that kind of supports that and helps with, uh, with the mitigation of that issue in different ways? Another, um, another example for how they differ is that one of the basic promises and like the great things about AI is that it learns and it changes, right? And this is something that goes against the grain of some of the, the ways that we were thinking about how products work, where we are looking for consistency. We are looking for a kind of a very stable, reliable experience. But once you have updated a model, your whole experience changes, right? So you have to think about that. Or if you don't think about it, many bad things can happen, right? Because uh, suddenly you did not 
uh, you are not able to match the user's mental model to what they're going to see and how these things will influence them. So there is no like, okay, I did it once, I solved the problem well, that's it. It is something that is a long conversation between the product developers of all disciplines and the product and the user, right? And this is something that needs to be thought about. And then there's the thing about the data itself and what you can do with the data and how do you build trust in a world where everything changes all the time, right? So now it's not about being able to say things confidently, but it's more about being able to help a user kind of cope with these constant changes in a way that will still leave them confident and will still leave them in control of what's going on. And that's a, this is, in my mind, are the big differences um, that as designers, we need to educate ourselves about what does it mean and what does a machine learning means. And then and another thing to, to think about as designers is that usually many, many cases, it's not just one model that creates the product. There my experience has been that you're using like five, six, seven, ten different models. Each one of them is taking care of a sliver of the entire thing. And it's and you're beating them together, you're stringing them together to create something. And there are interactions between each of the models. And then if you are kind of glossing over one of them, the effect can be um, can be really big, right? So again, going back to intent and going back to intention. If I can, yes and a billion. I just want to ride that wave on. <laughs> Go um, for it. So just you know, in, if, indulge me, if you will. So what you've described in my mind, Ruth, is what it means to democratize AI. So how do we go from understanding and knowing what AI is in the first place, seeing what information what data goes into that funnel of what AI is and how it works and how it sort of spits out some results that are supposed to be really great for us as humans um, to what does it mean to really understand that experience and understand the data about me that's being collected? Do I know what's being collected about me? Um, how is it being used, right? How is it being used and who's benefiting off of data? Who's getting paid off of having access to my data? That's how we democratize AI, at least in part. Um, whether or not you become someone who actually is going to work in this space, I'd argue that uh, AI is not just for techies. And in fact, if we ever see it that way, then that's exactly the way we're going to continue to have problems in this world. But AI actually is a combination of ethics, sociology, technology. How do we bring that humanity in? Well, by having the conversation among all these disciplines. That's how it happens, right? Mm -hmm. Holding ourselves accountable, recognize the value of doing no harm, which we hear all the time in social science research, IRBs, for example, where we are held to that account. Not so much in the tech space, but this is where that, ha that matters, where we're bringing together these disciplines in that awareness. But democratizing AI means that I know what, my, what data, first of all, I'm putting out there. So recognize that, and I recognize also how that data is being used. And I also recognize that sometimes the way those data are being used are not supporting and helping me at all. And in fact, they're making these generalizations about me because I've allowed a little bit of information to trickle out about myself. And I maybe haven't done my due diligence to keep it up to date or recognize that people are getting data that I don't even realize they have access to. So all that really matters, right? How do we learn more about how to participate? Well, recognize that your data matters. You know, We're seeing with the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act now that started uh, in Europe, where we're seeing a lot more protections for people moving across this country as well. Not as quickly, but it is. And so part of this is just knowing that uh, our data are out there. Your data are out there and they're being used. And to be a little bit more aware uh, and sometimes even discriminate, recognizing that sometimes you may not be able to download that app because it's asking for a bit too much information. And what does that mean, right? Uh, and again, getting back to this idea of access. 
who has it? And if I don't have it, am I missing out, right? All that stuff is a part of the, part of the, at least a media machine of what that looks like, but recognizing too, that this is, this is how it works a lot, a lot of the time. And a reminder that if it's free, then you're the product. <laughs> you're the product. Absolutely, Molly. Molly, you've spent a lot of time looking at how this is represented in the media, which is a big part of, of how we got here today, right? Uh, and you also uh, put a lot of work into thinking about and, and actively preparing a new generation of leaders through Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> what are the, right, you know, and, um, and all the writing and, and, you know, and other work that you do. Like, what are some of the things that, uh, how are we teaching? Well, a couple of things I do. Um, I mentioned earlier that I like collecting AI cliches. So I've, it's something I've done a few, in a few talks I've given where like I show AI is the new blah, it's the new blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but I also teach a class called AI in Society and another one called AI in Culture, which um, basically is a way to look at the science fiction depictions of AI and then to start suggesting other kinds of things, right? So one question I've got is maybe we need different cliches, right? Um, I'll do a thing sometimes in that class when we can meet in non-COVID times and do this like across a huge whiteboard and have people bring in examples of AI cliches. And they end up being robotics cliches and computation cliches. Things like um, the fembot from Six Million Dollar Man from the 1970s, which is kind of a Barbie doll. Um, actually, it's, I'm sorry, it's the, the bionic woman and mm -hmm. fembot. Um, go check eBay, it's really something. Um, but you know, anything from that or um, Rosie the Robot to um, the movie Ex Machina to Hal to you know, whatever it might be, The Simpsons, but getting all of those out on the board and starting to collect them together. And then we look at the fact that things like um, the word robot actually has been in use since 1921, when it was used for a Czech play called RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, which is about labor and uprising and humanity, questions of humanity. And so what we can do when we start looking at um, cliches and media representations and culture is we can start looking at the creative material um, for AI. Um, one thing, we've been talking a lot about data and data collection and representation, and there's kind of flip side of this, which is generativity, right? How we generate new things and new ideas. I know there's a question about GPT-3 right. um, in, in the, uh, in the Q&A as well. Um, but, you know, what, what happens when you start generating things? Um, I'm a really big fan of Janelle Shane's work. Um, in her blog, AI Weirdness, she has a book called You Are a Thing and I Love You. Um, this book is about uh, using, it's about what AI is using very funny examples that she's done by training um, neural nets on ridiculous things right. like uh, hamster names or um, These become Facebook memes, I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she has a Halloween costume. She did something in New York Times. Um, when you start getting sexy into the data set, um it's it's really ridiculous which pandemic um, household do you want to be in those things exactly yeah <laughs> she's so funny and so amazing but also really useful for seeing what the boundaries are between you and the algorithm in the world so there's kind of a critical angle there okay let me bring this back around to tie it up a little bit i think that when we look at at our culture and how um how we see ai depicted um we we understand that a lot of times it says some pretty negative things about women uh, about the power of women, about labor. Um, but we also see some in interesting possibilities for creativity. And um, it can belong, I can't remember whether it was Jamika or Ruth who said it, but that this is, this is stuff for everybody to play with, right? This is for, this is material for all, not just for some. And so we can start finding new ways that we can build and generate things. Um, using using these kind of algorithmic tools for sure yeah i um i realize it is uh two o'clock slash 11 on the west coast we do have uh i did want to wrap up with one last question for everyone and then take some of the questions that have come through 
Uh, so for those of you that have to drop off, we totally understand, but we invite you to stay with us as long as you'd like to, because we're having, I'm having fun. Are you guys having fun? <laughs> We, we knew we wouldn't get to it all, um, uh, but we do hope this is just the start. Um, so with that, I would love to talk a little bit, you know, about where you see all this going in five years and 15 years, et cetera, um, and what your hope is for the future and, and what success might look like. Jamika, you are shaking your head. I'm going to start with you. I'm shaking my head. Do I know what I'm going to say yet? But, you know, I, I, I think in general, I, what I hope, how about that? How, what I hope we're doing in five to 15 years, and I think we're closer, but we've got a long way to go. What I hope we're doing is shifting the burden of what access means and what awareness means. Right now it's on us mostly as people, as the consumers to be aware of what data we're putting out there or to be aware of having to take the time to actually read the end user license agreements, right? Which can take a long time to read or we just scroll down all the way until we click that box that says, okay, you can download now. Right now, a lot of that, the burden is on us. What might it look like if the burden is shifted more to those who are developing these technologies, who are exercising more awareness of the sensitivity, the privacy of collecting these data. It also means that we have to maybe shift our business model a bit but maybe we think too about what it means to, as designers anyway, to help our colleagues in the company to connect those business values, those business outcomes, those business measures to people, yeah. to humans. I think that's the value that design brings to anything that we do, which means that we can also drive to some extent and, and maybe even help create this mind shift of reducing the burden of our of our customers of the consumers of us the people we are the people we are the consumers such that yeah we recognize its importance but the burden isn't entirely on us either uh, or maybe not at all and that again is another level of responsibility i get that um but i'm hoping that that's what we that's what we move to which is again a part of democratizing this experience for everybody plus one Power to the I, want, I want to applaud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For saying that, Jamaica, I, I can I can go next. Um, so my hope is that we will all learn how to pay attention, and we will do things with intent, whatever that looks like. It is a very big umbrella of things. But attention and intent are, to me, represent the work that needs to be done in order for us to drive to a better future. Because if not, it's like it's a death by a thousand cuts, right? Like every little thing has its own little negative effect. And at some point, we're going to say, oh, what have we done? And, and it's going to be too late because it's not one system, right? It's not like you say, okay, there's this um, kill switch and everything is gone. You need to have this kill switch in every one of the solutions. And to do that, you need that intent and intention. Uh, but I'm also very uh, optimistic. Maybe I have no reason to be optimistic, but I'd like to. Uh, to think that uh, the awareness is growing and the fact that we're having these conversations, the fact that I'm seeing uh, more of these discussions happening in different places means that people are saying, hey, wait a minute. Um, so maybe, you know, we're, we're, we shouldn't lose hope and we should kind of push for it and say, okay, at some point, we're going, people want to do the, the right thing, at least most of us. Uh, so let's figure out a way to do it. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. I, I, I keep thinking of what my cousin who's a fly fisher um, says about, you know, you go out and the way you figure out what kind of tie to fly is by lifting up the rock and looking at what lives underneath it. And it just sticks in my head. Um, I think that as we look at questions of AI and technology, we need to pick up the rock and look at what's underneath it. We can't take the rock at face value. 
Um, and that there's, it, this is something that I try to do when I'm teaching, um, but it's also something I want to do in, in a conversation like this, or it's a reason why I like Janelle Shane's work, right? It, it, because it's an opportunity to look at what, what the mechanisms are and, and where we and they meet and what's, what's funny and what's scary about them. And, you know, in addition to this conversation that's happening at the end of a summer where George Floyd was murdered in my hometown, um, we also have an election coming up and the Republican National Convention kicks off next week. We have a rise of QAnon. We have a question of misinformation. If we are not all picking up the rocks and looking underneath, we're all gonna be in trouble. But if we pick up the rocks and look at what's underneath, maybe we can come up with our own interesting, unique, um, and situated approach approaches to what's going on um, that kind of meet us where we are and meet us where we need to go. And that's probably the weirdest metaphor I've ever used. <laughs> One of the questions from um, Leon Wang asked, um, fits in really nicely with what you just said, Molly. What are the actions each of us can take today in our lives, in our own relationship with AI? And with this new level of awareness, what can we do today that'll help us impact tomorrow? I say first, educate yourself. Yeah. You know, figure out what, what is, and I don't know, you know, what's your level of uh, familiarity with any of this. So I'm just going to be very generic here. But the first is awareness and education and understand what this set of technologies, because it's not even one technology, right? It's, we, we give it one name because it's easy. But really, uh, these are a set of very different technologies that do different things and are based on probabilistic systems, right? So maybe that's the, the common denominator. So figure out what it does and figure out how it connects to what you're doing, whatever your, your role is. And then within that space, see what conversation, like if you're thinking about, I want to bring change to the place that I work in, uh, who are the other people who are working in that space or interested in that space and start a discussion if this is not already happening from your, from the, I don't know, the, the top level, just make it, make it grassroots. That's how it can start and convince other people. Be an evangelist for, for this, you know, you can, you can activate it. You don't need to wait until someone activates it for you. And there are a lot of resources out there that can help you think through different things. Uh, but it's, it's okay to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and I want to learn. And I think that the growth mindset is something that everybody will benefit from. Because I remember when we just started doing things in Microsoft and it was all grassroots, one of the beautiful things was that everybody was so humble and so open for collaboration because everyone felt that they don't know anything. And you're talking to people that have been uh, in that area for like 10 years and they say, still they would say, yeah, I really don't know much about it. But, you know, people are, are at the point where they're, they're humble and collaborative, so bank on that and try to get that collaboration going on. And then it's really up to you. Mika, you have thoughts on that? Well, plus one. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to have conversations with you, just plus one. But <laughs> And that covers a whole lot of stuff. Um, I, I I agree. I you know it's 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 you know part of part of how we started this conversation was around you know what makes it different now and 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 how is the recognition of AI today maybe a little different maybe more progressive um, uh, and I mean that in the traditional sense of you know, it's moved along in a way that um, ha helps us to know a little bit more about context and, and how machine learning and trainings matter, the training of models matters. Um, 
but you know, if you if you are finding that there aren't a lot of people at the top who are pushing and asking these questions, I completely agree with Ruth. You know, be an evangelist. Um, I think you'll find that there are more of you than you think. And whether we call that grassroots a, a form of protest or not, the fact that there is a group of you who believes in the kind of change that we need to really create the kinds of experiences that matter for everybody. And by the way, we'll really never be able to create one thing that serves everybody. I think the opportunity is to create an experience that everybody can enjoy through utility of that thing or process, right? That's what we're talking about. And recognizing that when we do that, or we don't do that, there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of people who are left out of that experience. That actually is a form of protest. Hey, why aren't we doing this? And why don't we use this as a model? Or why aren't we checking ourselves or holding ourselves to account in a way that uh, we currently aren't? That actually grows. And when you find that there are, you'll find actually that there are a lot of people when, when those numbers come, it actually does a lot of pushing for you. And so if it starts with one person, it certainly doesn't end there, but keep, keep sounding that horn and, and, and raising that awareness. Um, more and more people actually are uh, ready for that level of conversation. Sometimes it just takes one person to start it. Thank you. I think that, um, I'll leave with this last question, and I think, Jamika, that your answer actually addresses that quite well, that which, uh, from, from Sean Horn. What if you create something with great intentions, but it turns out to cause harm? Is it undoable? I think, um, I think you know, a lot of what you just said about, you know, speaking up and, and just pointing it out, recognizing, starting a conversation is a, is a piece of that. Um, other thoughts, Molly or Ruth? I think that it also, like if you really did it with good intentions, you probably put some kill switch in it or, ah, yes. or thought about mitigations. You know, like this is, a, this is another thing that has to be part of every system that we're building, right? Because we, if you acknowledge to begin with that there might be consequences that right now you cannot see, you need to make sure that uh, there are mitigations in place that when you recognize that, it stops. And it, it really depends on what you're building, right? And how you do it. But um, that, that is because it might happen, you know? Right, yeah. The, but oh, the, the, one of the assumptions that we should build our AI driven uh, products on that it's going to it's going to cause harm and it's going to something bad is going to happen but we don't know what yet and we're trying to figure it out ahead of time but we might have not thought about everything i think that sometimes it depends oh, sorry jen go ahead no i, I was just going to say i think that's another place where and we've talked about this a little bit before ruth the role of the the designer and the, the relationship, the conversation between like the service, the product and the user evolves and the role of design, the designer in helping the, helping us as consumers understand um, that it is fallible. That it, if we think about data as being quantitative and empirical and, and, and absolute, but that, that this is an imperfect science. Yeah, and when we're looking at this, uh, these stakeholders in the systems, they are like the, your primary stakeholder, and this is your kind of vanilla scenario. This is what you're designing for. for. There's the secondary layer, which is who are kind of the bystanders and who are still involved in the system, but maybe you don't you don't see them as your primary goal. They, maybe they're not the ones that are paying you money but they're there and they're part of the system. And then the third layer is who is being excluded. And is that okay that they are being excluded? Mm -hmm. You're asking this three questions and you're answering this three questions, you're in a better place. And there's the question of sometimes actually, no, you can't undo it. Um, I, I don't know if you see the coffee mug I've got, if you're familiar with the trolley problem, um, the question of, you know, 
there, there are X number of people tied to a track, trolley is coming out of the way, what do you do? You're, you're the person throwing the switch. Oh, right. Right. Um, you can throw the switch and move the trolley and it goes on to a spur where it'll kill one person or you can let it keep going and you'll kill five. What do you do? And this is a this is this kind of logic problem or ethical problem has been uh, around since the late 60s. A female philosopher named Philippa Foot introduced it. But all too frequently, we use trolley problem as a way to talk about AI. And the fact is, there's so many different approaches, responsibility approaches, ethical approaches, um, and ways to talk about morality and responsibility that, you know, yes, it's possible you could do something, the harm for which cannot be undone. But as Ruth is saying, I think you can learn to build on that and, and learn from your mistakes. And um, hopefully you do, you do not end up there. Plus one. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Everything's plus one. I know. <laughs> With that, um, I'm going to say thank you to my fabulous friends and panelists for joining me in this conversation. Thank you to everyone listening uh, and participating. I know uh, we didn't really even scratch the surface of the topic. There's so much more to talk about and so many great questions and ideas that came through the panel and chat. Um, and we'd love to continue this conversation. I also want to thank Tea Leaves done an amazing job working with us. 